so you certainly don't have to have read my book to, to get anything from this, but I kind of had this idea to do something like this, both because I'm starved for social interaction because COVID and whatever, you know, um, so I don't really get a chance to like meet with folks. And because I closed my fibromyalgia practice, I'm not interacting as much one-on-one -on -one with fibromyalgia patients. So I've been missing that. So I had this idea like, hey, maybe I could kind of do like a book club and full disclosure, it was actually partly Desiree's idea. So go team. Um, and, and what I was thinking is, you know, it's been like seven years since the book was published. It's been eight years since I wrote it. And I thought I could kind of give a little summary about different topics from the book and then give any updates that have happened since the book publication. And, uh, you know, I certainly hope that one day I'll get a, like be able to do an updated revised edition. But if not, I thought it was pretty reasonable to just kind of do a little a little video update. And these days, I think a lot of us like to get our content uh, via video. And sometimes with the fibro brain, it works better to hear things that way. And it's also just nice, I think, to get information um, in a couple different ways. So you can read it, you can watch a video, listen to a podcast. I think that kind of helps us to just some like, oh, I'm so glad you guys have, I'm so glad you guys have my book. That makes me happy. Um, and I think you can get it internationally. I think it like from Amazon, I think, I know at least in Europe, um, India, they can get my books. I don't, I don't know internationally where else, but uh, I also have this fantasy of getting my book published in lots of different language. Oh yeah. And, and libraries, that's also another good way to get it. So Okay, so it's 2.05. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to welcome everybody that is joining me. Thank you so much for being here. And this is the first inaugural uh, Summer Book Club meeting. And uh, gonna, it's going to be pretty casual. And the idea is just to have a little bit of fun while we also maybe learn or refresh our memory. And it gives me a chance also to just talk about some of the newer things that have come out since since I published the book. So without further ado, I'll dive in. And we're really talking today about the contents that are in chapter three and chapter four in the book. So chapter three is the chain reaction that causes fibromyalgia. And chapter four is blocking the fibromyalgia chain reaction. So the idea is if we can understand the science of what is happening in our body, then we are better able to treat it. And I think this is where fibromyalgia treatment has really mm, fallen down, is that you know we're understanding more about what is happening in the fibromyalgia body, but we still haven't, that knowledge hasn't really trickled down to the actual you know, frontline doctors that are working with patients. And so because of that, patients find themselves in this place where they're having to sort of search out information for themselves. And, and I definitely remember when I was when I was first diagnosed, which is gosh, 24 years ago now, um, I remember my, you know, I was diagnosed by a chiropractor and then I had like no helpful information from any Western doctor that I, that I approached. And there wasn't really any information in my medical school textbooks. So I was really left to kind of fend for myself as far as like figuring out what the heck was going on in my body and what I could do to treat it. And so, you know, I read every book that was available in the, in the bookstore. Um, this was just at kind of the early stage of the, the internet. We didn't have as much information. It was not as, as useful as it is now. So I was just kind of bumbling around and it took me about a year to find things that actually started to really help. You know, it took me about a year to find things like myofascial release and to figure out that some dietary sensitivities were contributing to my inflammation and pain and to figure out that I needed to work on improving my sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And what makes me really sad is that, you know, 20 plus years later, I think so many patients still find themselves in that role where they kind of end up having to be their own doctor, so to speak, because their, their doctors don't know, don't know enough about fibromyalgia. And so that is why I wrote this book, actually, because I was like, you know, if people, 
if people have to be their own doctors, at least they need to be informed. And yeah, they're going to, they're going to know more than their doctors about fibromyalgia, but for whatever reason, that seems to be the way that it is with this illness. And it makes me angry, but if I focus too much on that, I get very non-productive. So I just have to kind of channel my rage and be like, okay, I'm just going to help everybody understand what's going on in their own body so that they can kind of try to get the best help for, for themselves. And as I learned more about what was happening in fibromyalgia, the idea of kind of seeing it as a chain reaction was really helpful for me to kind of figure out like, well, why is it that like my muscles hurt so much? Or, or why do I feel so unrested when I wake up in the morning? And like, how does this tie in with like why my, my muscles are tight all the time? And it, it seemed, it seemed like all these different like disparate parts of my body were going haywire. And that is confusing in and of itself. But once I could sort of visualize it or understand it as a chain reaction, for me at least, it became, it was like an aha moment, like, oh my God, okay, now I really understand what's happening. And then, okay, I can treat it by intervening at various different parts of the chain reaction. So that's kind of the way I, I have outlined it. And uh, as I've talked more about it, you know, since I wrote the book, um, one kind of visual that has come for me as I try to describe what's happening in our body is, so what we think happens is that in fibromyalgia, some triggering event, whether it's a trauma, a physical trauma, an emotional trauma, an infection, a major illness, uh, a major surgery, something happens that triggers the nervous system, and particularly the hypothalamus and the amygdala, the parts of our brain that regulate the stress response in our body. Something happens that causes those, those areas of the brain to turn on, and they don't turn off. And because they're on all the time, we have this constant hyperactive stress response activity. And that is sort of the trigger for all the downstream effects. And so, you know, scientifically, we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, which is also kind of the fight or flight nervous system is another way to say it. And then we talk about the parasympathetic or the rest and digest nervous system. And, and these are parts of the autonomic or automatic nervous system. And that's kind of the primal, the animal part of our brain that regulates things like digestion and sleep and body temperature, all those kind of basic things that happen and we don't think about it. We don't think about our heart pumping, but it just does it, right? So it's it's the autonomic nervous system that's sort of regulating the balance of, of that part of our nervous system, the, the really primal part. And so in fibromyalgia, that, that balance is off. And as I thought about it, I was like, well, how, like, what's a good visual for it? And I'm a big cat person. So I think the perfect visual for kind of the flight response, the, the fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system is a cat that has seen like a dog or another cat. And, and, you know, they like arch their back, they might hiss, all their hair is standing up on end. Every muscle is tight. Their eyes are dilated. I'm sure their heart is pumping because they're like totally totally on, on alert, right? Like danger. Oh my God, there's a big dog right there. Danger. That is the fight or flight nervous system. And that is a totally normal and helpful part of, of, of how animals exist, right? Like we need to know, we need to be able to run away from or fight off danger. Like that cat that is all like hissed and uh, that cat is primed to run away from the dog or attack the dog, right? So that's good. And then as soon as the dog passes, the cat, and they do this really quickly, they go back to like their normal state really quickly. Like my cat will do that all activated. 10 minutes later, I'll see him and he's like sound asleep on the couch, like, you know, laying on his back, no cares in the world. And I'm like, wow, fight or flight nervous system and rest and digest. So he very quickly goes back and forth and the nervous system totally should do that. We normally should do that. As soon as the danger passes, we go back. In fibromyalgia, we're constantly, we are the cat that is prime for danger all the time, including while we're sleeping, including while we're eating, 
without our conscious control, totally not able, we can't control it consciously, that is happening all the time. And short term, we can do that. Long term, it causes a lot of health issues. And you can imagine that a cat that's spooked like that is not going to be able to get into deep sleep. Well, not until they go back into the rest and digest mode. But let's say that cat is stuck in that mode, not going to be able to go back, get some sleep, right? Not going to, not really interested in food, not really going to eat, digestion's not going to be working well, heart's going to be pounding fast, you know, not going to be able to focus or concentrate on anything but, but that. Uh, muscles eventually will get really tired of being tight like that. And so it's just sort of a quick visual that somehow worked for me to think about in fibromyalgia, our nervous system has gotten spooked and it's totally in that fight or flight mode. And unlike normally where somebody without fibromyalgia, their nervous system goes back to normal, we just are stuck there. And so if we can figure out ultimately a way to get our nervous system unstuck, whether it's through deep brain stimulation or some other future modality, that is actually where I think we could have a cure for fibromyalgia. And that's what's kind of exciting to me. Like if we know the actual trigger, like where the problem is starting, that is potentially where we would find a cure. We don't have that now. So what we have to do is work on trying to lessen the downstream effects. And so that's why I kind of titled the, the chapters like the chain reaction that causes fibromyalgia and then blocking the chain reaction because at each step, we need to try to intervene if that if that makes sense. So, you know, the first thing that, that being in the fight or flight nervous system all the time affects is really sleep. And that is why most of us get really uh, not restful sleep, not deep sleep. I think I describe it in the book as, you know, sleeping with one eye open. And that was the thing that I really noticed when I first developed fibromyalgia. It was like all of a sudden, no matter how much I slept, no matter how long I slept, I didn't feel rested. It was like as if I almost felt worse after I slept. Like I woke up when I felt like achy and I felt like I'd been running a marathon all night and I was like exhausted. And I think that 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 was the part that really felt so like, I, I knew something was wrong. Like that wasn't normal. And previously I had been able to sleep. I mean, I wasn't like an amazing sleeper. I had some issues with insomnia before, but it was like, that was a very distinct change. And if you're not getting deep sleep, we have, it causes a whole host of problems. The biggest one, obvious one is fatigue. The next is brain fog. Like if you haven't slept well, even a few nights, like if you don't sleep well for a few nights, your brain is going to be foggy. And what I try to, so for people that don't have fibromyalgia and are trying to understand what it feels like, I say, okay, remember the last time you were really jet lagged? Like, let's say you flew to Japan. You'd been up for like 36 hours. Maybe you slept a little bit on the plane but you get there and your body feels so discombobulated and you're achy and you've been sitting in the chair and it's uncomfortable and your brain is just super fuzzy, but you feel kind of wired and tired at the same time. I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, but at least it's, it kind of, I think gets people like, oh yeah, that I do feel pretty terrible when I'm jet lagged like that. And then it's like, okay, yeah, that's, we feel like that all the time. And then plus, then there's all these additional things. But the more we can kind of help people understand people that don't have fibromyalgia, whether it's our doctors or family or whomever, I think the more kind of visuals or analogies we use, the better, the better we can be understood and heard and seen. So I'm just kind of sharing with you some of the visuals that have worked with, for me. And I've definitely used this as I talk with patients and as I talk with other doctors. And it seems to help. That's how I think humans really absorb information is kind of understanding, understanding things like that. Oh, yeah. Also, being a new parent, that's another thing. Like if you are an infant, you know, if you have an infant and they're six weeks old and you haven't slept hardly at all, like Oh my gosh. Yeah. That also is a really good analogy for people to understand. So chain reaction. Switch has been flipped in the brain, turned us constantly to the fight or flight mode that interferes with deep sleep. 
So we're fatigued, we're foggy, and we're inflamed. So studies have been done, lots of different interesting studies. Sleep deprivation causes inflammation levels in the body to go up, and it actually increases muscle pain. So just by sleep deprived, I mean, if you're healthy, but you're jet lagged, you haven't slept in 36 hours, you're going to feel more achy, and you're going to your body is going to be more inflamed and you actually have higher levels of inflammation in your body. So we know that that whole pathway is happening in fibromyalgia. Then the other thing that, that happens when you're activated in that fight or flight mode is that our muscles are tightened. And that is because we are ready to fight or flee. And so I, I, the other thing I remember really noticing that was abnormal or different in my body once I developed fibromyalgia was I became really aware about a hundred times a day, I became aware that I was like clenching my muscles. Like I was clenching my jaw or like I was clenching my stomach muscles or my pelvis or my butt muscles or my legs. And I remember being like, why, why am I like, I don't have any reason to be clenching. Why am I clenching? And then I'd, I'd tell myself like, okay, relax. And then 20 minutes later, I'd be like, oh, yep, I'm, I'm doing it again. So we're doing it all the time. And it's not just an observation. It's not just like we feel that way. Our muscles actually are more tense. And this is kind of an update from what I wrote about in, in the book. So I, I wrote about in the chain reaction, I think it's in chapter three, about how uh, studies have been done where they looked at fibromyalgia patient muscles and healthy controls, and they did some uh, pressure measurements. So they use those same kind of pressure gauge needles you use to like check the air pressure in your tire. And they did that into fibromyalgia muscles and then to healthy controls. And so some of like what I put in the book was just some very early data where they'd been looking at that. And there was a couple of like abstract small studies that have been published saying, yeah, there's more higher levels of pressure, which is, you know, interesting. And, and I, you know, I it was worth publishing in there. But last year, this really interesting, much bigger study came out where they looked at same kind of thing, but they looked at a lot more people and they looked at people with fibromyalgia, people with rheumatoid arthritis and healthy controls. And healthy controls and rheumatoid arthritis patients did not have elevated um, pressure in their muscles. Fibromyalgia patients, however, had levels of pressure in their muscles that were high enough that they were almost to the point where we would be concerned about something called compartment syndrome. And that is considered like a surgical emergency where if there's like swelling within like a compartment, a muscle fascia compartment in your leg, if there's so much pressure in there that it's going to damage the, the muscle cells themselves or the tissue themselves, that's called compartment syndrome. And it's considered a surgical emergency. You have to like get in there, open, you know, drain it. So we weren't quite at that level when we were almost. And I was like, Oh my God, like our muscles are so tight. We're almost at a surgical emergency level. Like, hello, no wonder our muscles hurt. Like, come on. And so to me, I was like, oh my God, this, this article should be like on the front page. Like, wow, this is, I mean, nothing. Like I guarantee if you go to your doctor and be like, hey, did you hear about that study where they showed really high pressures and fibromyalgia patients' muscles? I'm like, what? Like for whatever reason, this information does not get out there. So I kind of feel like, I guess maybe that's my job now is to like make sure it gets out there. But now, you know, you know, so we have really tight muscles and those tight muscles are really unhappy. They're painful. They're inflamed. And it's not just the muscles. It's also the connective tissue or the fascia that surrounds those muscles and penetrates through the muscles. So we have myofascial inflammation and that is very painful that is, makes us really exquisitely tender. This is why a cat, gosh, I'm talking a lot about cats. I am a crazy cat lady, I guess now. <laughs> you get divorced and I just need to get 10 cats and you know, there you go. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So cat jumps on your lap and you're like, oh, that hurts. And I remember being like, how come it doesn't hurt other people when cats jump on the, oh, I guess it's because my muscles are so sore, you know? So it's, we're, we're so tender. And part of why we're so tender is because of that myofascial inflammation. And interestingly, the fascia that surrounds our muscles is actually much more sensitive to pain than the muscle itself. 
And the fascia has both uh, pain sensing nerves and sympathetic or fight or flight system nerves. And that is another update since publication. There has been a lot more interest in kind of understanding the fascia. And I have always been interested in it ever since I kind of figured out like, wow, there's something going on in the fascia and fibromyalgia. But the scientific community starting in like the mid 2000s started to really look at um, kind of the fascia. And there's some amazing scientists, mostly in Europe, like in Italy, there's a big group of, of kind of an anatomy scientists that are looking at the fascia. And what they found is that they're, the fascia is really rich in both pain sensing nerves, but also sympathetic system nerves, fight or flight system nerves. And they think that is because it's actually the fascia that they think contracts in response to danger. So the best way to think about this is, uh, you know, if you if you think about somebody doing like a heroic act in like a time of danger, like for example, they're somebody's kid gets stuck under, you know, a heavy car or something, and and some some person that weighs 100 pounds is able to, you know, the mom is able to lift the car off the kid because because there's such this, you know, adrenaline rush. And what what they think causes that additional strength in that moment is a huge amount of fight or flight nerve signaling that causes the fascia to contract really strongly. So we know that the fascia contracts in response to fight or flight signaling. But do you see how that might be a problem if it's happening all the time? So our fascia is really tight, it's angry, it's inflamed, and we're really prone to developing trigger points, which are kind of inflamed knots of uh, muscle and fascia cells. So this is why as we start to think about like the, the chain reaction, and this is only part of the chain reaction, I, I don't have time to cover it all, but the parts that are sort of relevant and there have been updates is, is what I'm talking about. As we start to like think about it as a chain reaction, you can see how different um, interventions could help, right? Myofascial release or things that work on lessening the, the tension in the, in the myofascial system, particularly in the fascia. Oh yeah, I can see how that, that would help reduce pain. Okay, yeah, so, so getting, getting better sleep, finding ways to get deep sleep. Okay, yeah, that's gonna help fatigue and fog. And then anything that we can do to kind of help shift the balance of the fight or flight nervous system and the rest and digest nervous system. So as I said, we're in fibromyalgia, we're constantly in the fight or flight mode, but there are things that we can do to actually help temporarily push us into rest and digest. We haven't found a way to keep us permanently back into the normal state, which is rest and digest most of the time and fight or flight only with danger. We're like all the time here, but sometimes in rest and digest. And the more we can push ourselves into that rest and digest mode, the more, the better we feel. And that is why things like yoga and meditation and deep breathing and cranial electrical stimulation and all the things that I talk about, I think it's in chapter six, no, eight and nine, chapter eight and nine. I'm talking about like ways that we can help ourselves. We can harness things that we can do to harness our rest and digest, to bring us into that mode as much as we can. And it's kind of like hitting the snooze button. Like we can kind of get out of the fight or flight mode for a little bit. The more that we can do that, the better we feel. So this is why even doing like five minutes of deep breathing in a day might really help because your nervous system just is, is going to be better off for, for that the rest of that day, or, you know, even for a few hours. So, oh, hello, Spipe support fibromyalgia network. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think that kind of covers the, the big parts of the chain reaction and kind of the updates, but just in the spirit of completeness, I just wanted to say that kind of the other aspects and what kind of the more fine tuning parts of treating fibromyalgia are that in that chain reaction, other things that happen include like affecting our hormones. So we have a lot of cortisol that's being pumped out for a period of time until our adrenals burn out. And then we've got adrenal burnout that needs to be addressed. That cortisol adrenal burnout issues kind of affect how our thyroid functions. So we're more prone to hypothyroidism. And if we do have hypothyroidism, we need to be treated a little bit differently. So sort of hormone imbalances, inflammation, and then leaky gut. Leaky gut is kind of the other big, the big piece, because when we're in the fight or flight mode, 
our gut becomes more leaky. Leaky, and this this happens in you know humans. It happens in animals, lab rats. If they are stressed, the their gut becomes more porous, and so then more particles are getting through that uh, can generate an inflammatory reaction. And I would say that maybe is one other update. When I was writing this book, the concept of leaky gut was totally not understood by the conventional Western docs. I mean, that was just like, a, if you said that, they were just like, what? what are you talking about? Now, it actually is much more accepted. And in fact, I was doing, I did a, a CME, like continuing medical education class recently. And it was just a standard Western medicine class. And it was led by a gastroenterologist. And he was talking about leaky gut. And I was like, oh, what? Like, wow. And nobody in the audience was looking like he'd grown a third head or something. So, so it is starting to be more accepted. It's not like every doc is going to be aware of it, but if the GI doctors are talking about it in a CME course, you know, I, I was like totally blown away. So I, I think some of those concepts are becoming more accepted in, in the wide stream medicine. Um, but I mean, of course, naturopaths have known about it for decades, but I digress. So that's kind of the other area. So like digestion, inflammation, hormone imbalances. Um, those are kind of the, the other areas that, that we need to work on. But I think those are, I, I view those as a little bit more like fine tuning, like the, the prime things that we really need to focus on, particularly when we're thinking about, you know, the earlier in that chain reaction, you can intervene, the better, like the more different streams you're going to be able to affect, right? Like as, as opposed to if you're just working over here, like the earlier you can stop things, if you think about something like like a riverbed, right? Like the earlier in the river you can get things addressed, the, the more branches you're going to be able to affect. So I think trying to remember like, okay, the best thing I can do for myself is every day try to do something that is going to activate my rest or digest nervous system. Every day I'm going to try to work on sleep. I'm going to try to work on maybe doing a little gentle stretching. So my fascia isn't so tight. You know, that's the kind of, those are like the basics. That's like the bread and butter, so to speak. And then everything else is useful and important, but I think we, we need to really build that foundation first. And that is why I wrote the book kind of like in steps, like step one, step two, you know, so like step one is rest. Step two is repair. Those are really focusing on, on the aspects that I'm, I'm talking about. And it doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but I just thought that that would be useful because at least, and I'm almost done, we're almost going to get to questions here. But I do recall when I was, when I was finally starting to figure out not exactly what was going on in my body, but that there was, I was finding, I was stumbling onto things that helped me. And as I was trying to, you know, think about them, it was really easy to get super overwhelmed, particularly around things like diet. You know, I was like, oh my God, do I have to do like macrobiotic or vegan or only this or only that? Or, you know, like I just, it was, it's so overwhelming, particularly when your brain is foggy and you're just like trying to figure out like what I can do to help myself that at a certain point I was like, wait, we just need to simplify it so that we can just be like, I'm just going to work on sleep. So that is the way that I, I, that's why I wrote the book that way. Um, some people might, might not like that, but it worked for my brain and I was hoping it would work for other people's brains. So with that, I think I've babbled on long enough uh, about the chain reaction. I'm wondering if there are some questions that people have come up. Oh, you guys, thank you so much for all your lovely like comments and congratulating me on my mouse study publication. Thank you. Oh yeah. I should probably mention that as one update. Uh, didn't talk about it in the book because we didn't know about it back then. But the end of this chain reaction is that our nervous system gets hypersensitive to pain. And we didn't really realize what was the step that kind of caused that. Like we knew all these things happened. And then at the end, there was central nervous system hypersensitivity. And what the mouse antibody study showed really showed us that the immune system is involved in kind of that last final step. I think we're still working out a lot of the details, but 
you know, in, in the book, I just kind of say like that the nervous system is overwhelmed by all the pain signals that are coming into it. And that that is kind of what maybe triggers the central nervous system hypersensitivity. But it turns out that there's, you know, some steps in between that that uh, include the immune system and its role. So that part is very interesting. And if you've not, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there is another um, video, I think it was like two or three weeks ago, I released uh, about the mouse antibody study. And there's a link to it. Um, basically, they, they showed that in uh, healthy mice, if you give them antibodies from fibromyalgia patients, they developed central central sensitization. So there was there was some uh, clear evidence that there were antibodies and immune system involvement in developing that hypersensitivity. So um, I think it is really really interesting, and actually, it's really interesting times. Hopefully, we'll get some more um, more studies done. Okay, any questions or comments let's see oh yes and I love thank you Mary Healy we are fibro fierce all together I totally agree let's see Desiree is a pass can you like pin a comment I don't know if that's or a question well I see one here I'm going to jump into it. Uh, vagus nerve stimulation. That is a very good question. Um, I just actually read a study about vagus nerve stimulation for fibromyalgia. So basically the concept of that is the vagus nerve is sort of the highway that runs the uh, rest and digest mode. So the sympathetic nervous system comes out of our, our brain and spinal cord and kind of at the top and the bottom and it, it goes, or actually it goes kind of through our center vertebrae. Um, so there's sort of certain nerves that run, run the sympathetic nervous system and then there's other nerves that run the rest and digest. And the vagus nervous is the main highway for that. So the idea is if you can stimulate the vagus nerve to have more activity, does that improve, you know, gives us more time in the rest and digest mode, will that improve our symptoms? So we know about doing vagus nerve stimulation. It's been used for a long time for treatment of depression. It definitely has some positive mood effects. So we've got some good data there. Um, what we're finding is if you stimulate the vagus nerve, it definitely also helps reduce inflammation. So it has an anti-inflammatory effect, seems to have a mood boosting effect. Interestingly, the early studies are not showing a lot of pain relief. And I don't think they know exactly why that is. Um, and it's possible that just the way they're stimulating it is, it's not very like um, elegant the way they're stimulating it. It's really just like they either do an implant in, in the vagus nerve in, where it runs in your neck and that's like a surgical procedure or there's some ex external things that, that stimulate it. But it's not like a very, it's just sort of like an electrical, like mm, it's just trying to kind of add more electrical activity. And, and so it's not like they can really like dial in or fine tune it. And so maybe they'll figure out new, better ways to do it. Um, but at this point, it's really, you know, to get a surgery, to have something implanted in your, in your neck, to get like some improvement in inflammation and maybe some improvement in mood. It doesn't seem to help a lot with sleep or pain. And that's all really, we, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I don't think they quite know exactly why that is, but I am going to do, I was going to do a research update video about this article because I thought it was kind of interesting. So that is a great question. And then the final thing about that I'll say is I had a patient um, who had fibromyalgia and then also had really bad depression. And she had a vagus nerve implant done for the depression piece because that's what it's like FDA approved for right now. And it helped somewhat with her depression it didn't really give her any benefit for the fibromyalgia piece. So I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like maybe the way we're doing it is the right way for fibromyalgia, but maybe it's got some potential down the road. Oh, look, okay, I think I've now I see Desiree has put some little comments. Beautiful, okay. So there's a question about uh, stellate ganglion block. Um, 
So that is basically blocking part of the sympathetic nervous system. And does that help with fibromyalgia? They also are using it for PTSD. That is showing some benefit. Again, not as much for pain, more for kind of the, um, the hypervigilance component. Uh, and I think, again, if they, if they figure out different ways to do it, it could work. Right now, they basically are kind of just going in and electrically, um, they're going into one part of the sympathetic nervous system and kind of killing it off, honestly. And so it seems like maybe that gives some localized benefit, but then the sympathetic nervous system really just finds another way to kind of route around that. So thus far, not hugely helpful, but maybe, maybe down the road. Um, okay. Excessive heart palpitations associated with anxiety, neck pain, and stiffness. Well, first, almost everybody with fibromyalgia has anxiety, neck pain, and some amount of stiffness. We vary kind of in where, where we feel stiff. Um, so those are all really common. And I think a lot of us experience uh, noticing kind of fast heart rate. That's part, if you think about all the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, that's all part of fibromyalgia. The heart palpitations, meaning like either an irregular rate or uh, having times where it goes up really, really high, that is not so much related to fibromyalgia. That's probably related more to like an underlying other issue with, with the heart electrical stimulation but that is certainly being triggered to go off more frequently because you have all this sympathetic nervous system signaling into the, into the heart. But yeah, that was a good question. So the overlap with myofascial trigger points. So everybody, whether you have fibromyalgia or not, can develop a myofascial trigger point. And again, that's like a painful knot of, of tissue. And one of the more common areas when I give talks to doctors, I always say like, Hey, if you want to feel a trigger point, if you're right-handed go right up here. So kind of right, right in your trapezius, right above the edge of your shoulder blade, right there. If anybody that's like our, our mousing muscle or our like, you know, devicing muscle, anybody that, uh, does a lot of that, and is not using very good ergodynamics, which of course nobody is using perfect uh, ergonomics. Almost everybody will have a, a tender point there, and they they can feel like just a little like a little bunching of hard tissue, or sometimes it even feels more like a little pee. It's very painful when you press on it, and when you press on it, sometimes you'll get pain that kind of radiates out of it. So healthy people that don't have fibromyalgia will have between zero and two trigger points when they've done studies, um, and that's pretty normal. With fibromyalgia, we tend to have between 11 and 20. I mean, our muscles tend to be really kind of riddled with them. Uh, and so we're just really prone to getting them. And that is why we have to be sort of extra vigilant, I think, about good ergonomics, because any muscle that is sort of being used, um, like being strained, any muscle that's being strained, being overused or used not in the right direction, the direction it doesn't like to go in, is going to develop a trigger point. And the best ways to treat trigger points are trigger point injections, where they use lidocaine, find the trigger point, inject it in there. And it seems like the actual stimulation of the, the needle somehow sort of untangles or, or kind of gives that that bunched up part of the muscle a different signal and it can help it kind of to un, unravel. You can do it with lidocaine. You can do it with just, they call it dry needling, which is, I don't like it because it's painful, but basically they're just sticking a, a needle, a thin needle, like acupuncture needle, just kind of sticking it in your muscle. I don't like that. I prefer the lidocaine. Um, you can also treat it with just sustained pressure. So either, you know, you doing it or someone else doing it, um, or they have like, you know, a um, Theracane, something where you're kind of having sustained pressure for four or five minutes, kind of at different angles. You can actually manually break them up. Myofascial release is really helpful for that. So those are important to address. 
Um, and then I think, let's see, other question. And I can't really answer specific like medical type questions, unfortunately, um, like about individual stuff. Um, TENS machines can, can help with that for sure. So the question about neuroplasticity is a great question. So the concept of neuroplasticity is that our nervous system, meaning our brain, spinal cord, the nerves that go out to our, our periphery, that they have some ability to um, change, that they can be plastic, that they can re reroute and refigure. And so the idea is, let's say our nervous system is ramped up, it's in this state of central sensitization. Maybe that's not necessarily a permanent state. Maybe that there are things that we can do, whether it's through you know, cognitive things, thinking about things differently, moving our body differently, giving different stimulation to the nervous system, whether it's through electricity or whatnot. So the concept is that our nervous system is not fixed. It's not like, you know, it's always going to be like this. There's no possibility for change. And I think that that, that does give me some hope. That certainly is is hopeful, particularly for those of us that are feeling like, oh my God, my nervous system is on fire. And is it always going to be like this? No, there definitely are ways that we can modify it. But are we, I think we're like, like we know that there's neuroplasticity and then we know like this much about ways to, to do it. So that's kind of the next step is figuring out like, how do we do that? And I will say, I know I sound like a, I sound like I'm shilling myofascial release, but I make no money from myofascial release. <laughs> um, I have found for me that when I get a lot of myofascial release, it does seem like it is shifting, not just my tissue, like my muscles. It feels like it shifts my, my nervous system and it feels like um, it overall ramps down my, my pain hypersensitivity. So perhaps that is one way that we can communicate back up to our nervous system in a way that's positive in fibromyalgia is actually through our fascia. Because if you think about it, the fascia is rich with pain sensing nerves. It's rich with fight or flight nerves. Well, those are not one way nerves. They go down and they go back up to the nervous system. So how can we signal back up to the nervous system? Like, hey, no need to be, you know, hypersensitive where, where it's everything's okay down here. So it's stuff like that that I think about like, okay, that would make sense. And I know when I'm getting a lot of myofascial release, my overall level of pain is much better. Like I'm, I feel much more just quieted down. It's like my nervous system is quieted down. So the challenge is not everybody can access myofascial release, right? And so Mary has a good question here. She says, I don't have a John Barnes trained myofascial release therapist near me. Ideas. So the form of myofascial release that I have experience with personally is uh, the one created by John Barnes and his website, if you want to learn more about him and his, his approach is myofascialrelease.com. I'll put that in the description. And then you can look for therapists near you at mfrtherapist.com. Okay. Well, let's say you don't have anybody near you. Another option is finding somebody that does a different style of myofascial release or a different type of um, therapy that also addresses the fascia. So rolfing is a similar but slightly different way to address the fascia. Osteopathic manipulative therapy. So a doctor that is a DO rather than MD, they often will have done some training in osteopathic manipulative therapy, which is very similar to myofascial release. Some chiropractors do some things that affect the fascia. Some physical therapists do some things that affect the fascia. So trying to find somebody that does something with the fascia, but not in a way that hurts you because some like personal trainers will sometimes say like, hey, I do my fascia release, like get on this roller and like roll this really painful part out. And, and sometimes it's like too much. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not. So if it feels wrong to your nervous system, don't do it. But sometimes we have to open up to like, okay, let's try different, different approaches, different ways to address the fascia. The other thing is doing self myofascial release. And there was actually a study done and that is an update that I didn't put in here, came out a few years ago, study looking at self myofascial release and how it did for fibromyalgia pain. And it had pretty good results, not quite as good as myofascial release done by a 
practitioner, but really good results. So the concept is basically using uh, stretches at home or using tools, like I did a video on the cranial cradle, which I should have next to me, but it's a little tool that you can kind of use to get in different positions, like to stretch. Um, so there, there are ways and tools that you can use to do it for yourself. No, it's not it's not perfect, but it definitely can give you a lot of benefit. And if you're somebody that does things pretty pretty religiously, if, if you're like really consistent, you can get a lot of results with it. Um, the other idea, and this really only works if you are independently wealthy, which, you know, not a lot of us are these days, um, but there are places like Don Barnes has these like retreat centers where you can go and like get myofascial release for a week or two and if you can get it covered by your insurance, it might be doable. So maybe trying to go and get some intensives, they call it, and then coming back. And then if you do some myofascial release and then come back and you can do the stretches yourself, you can kind of continue the benefit. Um, but yeah, that is that is a big challenge is if you can't find somebody to, to do it. Um, but there are ways to take care of yourself. And I do have, if you go to my website, uh, Dr. Ginevra, and go to the store part, I, I list like all the different tools and stuff I use for myofascial release. So that might be a good option. Um, yes, Gail, totally. Gail is actually one of those people, if I might share, that is very good about finding stuff that works for her and doing it religiously and getting a lot of benefit. Like she has done amazing stuff for herself with self myofascial release. Hopefully I didn't share too much, Gail, but you're, you're really quite, quite good at that. Okay. So the, we got time for a couple more questions. Um, is a profound drug-like wooziness part of fibro? Yeah, that's. I would say that's kind of like the fibro fog at its worst. Like if you if you aren't sleeping well and you wake up and you're kind of foggy and then it just sort of doesn't get better. So that kind of woozy, foggy. I mean, that's I would say like the most severe end of fibro fog. The complicating factor is though, some of the sleep medicines that we use to help get sleep at night can still be in our system in the morning and kind of contribute to this like grogginess, haze. Some of the bigger offenders are things like trazodone, amitriptyline, some of those type of medicines. Like they really, at least when I've tried them, they really are in my system until it seems like noon the next day. And so trying to adjust dosages or take them earlier. So trying to figure out like, is it, is there any medication that is making this worse? And then some component of it is certainly fibro fog. The other thing that can cause that wooziness is high inflammation levels. So are you eating something that's making you feel terrible? And if you're eating things that are toxic or, or causing a lot of inflammation in your body, one way that you can feel that is sort of in this woozy, like just terribleness. So I would say look for things that might be generating inflammation, look to see if there's any meds that are making things worse, but know that some underlying amount of that is, is fibro fog. And then uh, the nightly alertness that that question refers to, uh, I often see that as part of adrenal burnout where during the day, our adrenals aren't doing what they should. So we don't have enough cortisol. So we're like really tired. And then at night, they kick on, which is not when they're, it's like they're in the opposite, the wrong schedule. Then at night, they kick on, gives us insomnia, can't go to sleep. And then the cycle kind of continues. So it might be if you're noticing that type of pattern, that is when I would maybe look at adrenal burnout. And a lot of naturopaths and kind of alternative providers are familiar with that. Adrenal burnout is still a concept that that Western docs do not, that has not come into the Western medicine understanding, unlikely he got. All right, let's see. Got time for one or two more questions. Oh, this is a really good one. Some doctors explain fibro as a low threshold of pain. Is it true? Well, yes, it is true, but it is a very incomplete and inadequate description. What they're talking about is actually the central pain hypersensitivity or the sensitization of our central nervous system, meaning it takes a lot less stimulus, a lot less input to generate a 
pain signal in the brain. And we know this from imaging studies in fibromyalgia. We know this in lots of different ways. This is like the most well-documented scientific abnormality in fibromyalgia is that our brain and spine, our central nervous system, are hypersensitized to pain. So one way to describe that is that we have a lower threshold for pain, meaning it takes less pressure or less input to cause pain. It's hard though, because that, that is like, as I said, that's sort of the very end of the chain reaction. So if a doctor only understands fibromyalgia as that, they have a very limited view of it. And, and that is honestly what most doctors that aren't very enlightened about fibromyalgia, they at least know that that happens in fibromyalgia. And that is the part that central nervous system hypersensitivity is exactly what the drugs that are available for fibromyalgia that are FDA approved, that's what they target. So Cymbalta, Lyrica, Savella, which is another antidepressant similar to Cymbalta, those are the three FDA approved medications for fibromyalgia and they all target that. They're designed to help make it so that our nervous system isn't quite as sensitive to painful stimuli. And that is helpful, but it's certainly, it's like the very end of the chain reaction. And to me, I feel like that's such a, it, it's such a part partial way to treat fibromyalgia. And it's not treating, it's like treating one final piece, but it's not, it's like ignoring all these other things that are really generating so much of the symptoms. Like if you're only treating that piece, you're not addressing the pain, the, the fog, you're not addressing the sleep, the fatigue, the hormone issues, the leaky gut, not addressing like the painful, you know, trigger points, the tight fascia. It's just such a, just such an inadequate and incomplete approach, but you know, it's better than at least they, they understand that. And I will say that that is progress and I'm very glad. And that has also probably, and I'll end on this because it's kind of a good, it's a happy note. Um, I would say one of the amazing things that has happened since I wrote the book really in 2015, it was published in 2016. Since then, the, there has really been a shift most doctors, it's it's much more rare these days to find a doctor that doesn't believe in fibromyalgia. They at least believe it exists. Now, are they like a total jerk about it? Do they like, I think somebody wrote that like the rheumatologist said, yeah, you have fibro, but you know, I don't really have anything to, to teach you or talk about it. You know, like the, there's still that. Maybe doctors don't know how to treat it. And they might still have some negative feelings about it because it still has this stigma. But there's so much scientific evidence now, and even so much more than since I wrote the book, that you really can't be a fibromyalgia denier anymore. And that is progress. And it's sad that like that's the progress. And I'm like, yay, great. But it's a lot different than when I was diagnosed and, and people that are, you know, from my era or older, totally will understand, like, right? Like at least doctors believe it is real now. And more enlightened doctors actually even will then start to talk about, okay, well, well, there's pain, you know, but there's this, let's work on your fatigue. You know, it, it, at least there is more enlightenment. We're getting fewer doctors saying it's all in your head and that's progress, but we still have so much room to go. And there's so there's such a lack of understanding, I think, of the myofascial involvement in fibromyalgia. There's a lack of understanding of the sleep issues in fibromyalgia, the hormone issues. And this is where we as patients have to, unfortunately, be in the role of bringing some information to our doctors. So my final shameless plug is that the last part of the fibro manual I wrote as um, kind of an appendix, something that you could maybe share with your doctor that would help them to be able to look at the studies. Doctors like to look at evidence um, that would help them understand why they might need to work with you on sleep or why they might need to work with you on myofascial release or hormones or, or whatever. And so, you know, it's sad and it's infuriating that we were in that position. But at the very least, I feel like at least now we can arm ourselves both with some knowledge and also 
the piece that I really want to make sure that each of you know here is that like just existing and having fibromyalgia, just surviving makes us fibro fierce. Like it is, it, it sucks. Fibromyalgia sucks. Like there's not any two ways about it. It just does. But if you are able to persist and exist and have the inspiration and know that there are other people out there, just like everybody in the chat here and me, and we, we know what you're going through. We believe it's real. We're here to support each other and also know that it's possible to feel better. It's possible to get better. And that's sort of the, the fierceness that I'm kind of envisioning is both the concept of like, I have the knowledge that can help me. And I have the inspiration to be able to fight through this, to be able to enact or, or fight for those things that I know will help me or I think will help me. And that's kind of my mission, I feel like. You know, I my mission now is part of why I closed the Frida Center was so that I could focus more on trying to educate patients and then hopefully educate um, doctors so that less and less of us are in that position of having to educate our own doctors. Well, for now, oh, I wanted it to be an hour and it's like 59 and 52 seconds. So nailed it. If I did not get to your question or comment, I apologize. I really thank you all for being here and for um, being patient with me as we figure this out. We've got five more of these uh, coming up throughout the summer. And the last one is gonna be a ask me anything. Um, except for personal medical advice. So um, that can be fun, but it's also going to be just covering different topics. So stay tuned, uh, both on the, um, my Facebook page is a good way to be kept up to date. If you want to be on my email, mail list, it's at Dr. Ginevra. That's also a good way to be notified of upcoming things like this. And we're going to do other random fun things in this, in this summer. Um, I really appreciate you all coming and all your kind comments. And I think I think with that, I'm going to sign off, say thank you, and stay fierce, everybody. See you next time.